This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Open to us, open to us the gates of God, the gates of God. We will go in, we will go in and praise the Lord and praise the Lord. Open to us the gates of God. We will go in and praise the Lord. Open to us, open to us the gates of God. Good morning and welcome to our service for July 26th, the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Alpha and Omega, our beginning and our end, and although we cannot be together physically at this time <clears throat> to worship you, you have given us a yearning to join together in your presence. It is this yearning within us that has brought us together through the wonders of technology this morning. Take these moments, O Lord of time and space, and use them to enrich our lives and bring us closer to you through your Holy Spirit. May our worship bring us peace and joy. Help us to make the most of each precious moment. For in your name we have gathered and we pray. Amen. Please join me in praying the Collect for Purity and the Collect for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the Collect for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. God of eternal wisdom, you alone impart the gift of discernment. Grant us understanding hearts, so that we may choose wisely between the treasures of your promised reign and this world's counterfeits. Through Jesus Christ, the pearl of true value. Amen. I am the dream and you the dreamer. I am the song and you are the rhyme. You are the tune sung in every silence. You are the now in the endless stream of Jesus told the disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into three measures of flour until all that was left. I have to say here that I don't think Jesus had ever actually done this because he didn't seem to remember to put the water in. Anyway, I'm going to take three measures of flour. One, two, three, and I have the water and I have the yeast. So I'm going to add the, the water to the yeast and then I'll come back in a few minutes when it's all ready and mix them together. At this point I've mixed the flour and the water together with the yeast and I'm going to now put it covered with a cloth on the step where it's nice and warm for about 45 minutes. Well, as you can see, the dough has risen a great deal thanks to the effect of the yeast, which is called leaven. And so it, the whole mixture has been leavened, just as Jesus said. I'm now going to, uh, to 
pour it out of the bowl and knead it, which is rather boring, so I won't show you that, but I will show you what happens afterwards. Well, as you can see from the two pictures, the bread turned out all right. The first picture has the, uh, the rolls that I made for lunch uh, ready to go in the oven, and the second one has them as they came out of the oven ready to leaven that yeast. Managed to make the ordinary flour and water into delicious bread. <clears throat> and I thought to myself, well, how does that relate to what uh, Jesus said about the kingdom of heaven? And it struck me, therefore, that we could be like the leaven. That if we go out into the world and we behave well, we treat other people well, we don't discriminate, we treat them kindly, that we can be like the leaven that will make the world a better place. And I think that that's essentially what Jesus had in mind, that he said, if we could be like the leaven, then the kingdom of heaven would come closer to earth. So let's pray that that will be the case. Amen. A reading from Matthew's Gospel. Jesus put before the crowd another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. In his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went out and sold all that he had and bought it. This is the Gospel of Christ. Today, Matthew tells us that Jesus talked to the crowds and the disciples in parables. Jesus and the, and the Gospel writers were all excellent storytellers. In their mostly non-literate society, they had to make their message memorable. Dry lectures would not have cut it. They had to tell stories. And as a university teacher, I automatically got into the habit of telling stories about toxicology and about environmental chemistry partly because I enjoyed presenting the material that way, and I hoped that the students would enjoy it too. We just listened to four of Jesus' shortest parables. They told his hearers what the kingdom of heaven will be like. The first two explain that the kingdom will be something you'd never have guessed. A tiny mustard seed grows into a great shrub. That's the image of Paul and Barnabas taking the message of Christianity into the whole of the Middle East. They made new converts and they changed whole areas to what would later become Christianity. He also used the image of a speck of yeast that can leaven a whole loaf of bread. And this is a very interesting metaphor for the coming Kingdom of Heaven. As I said to the children, Jesus seems to suggest that those of us who try to follow his teachings might be able to leaven those around us. And that would bring the kingdom closer. However, leavening happens unseen. It happens stealthily. And first century society did not know anything about the existence of yeast. They used a small piece previously leavened to make leavened bread, like using sourdough. Leavening must have seemed just like magic. It made the temple authorities suspicious of leaven. It seemed to be sly, not really pure. And that's why Jews had to remove all leavened products from their homes to prepare for Passover, to make their homes truly pure. The other two parables depict the kingdom as incredibly valuable. One image is that of a field that contained buried treasure chest. Another is that of an amazingly beautiful pearl. And you would sell everything that you had in order to be able to own either the pearl or the gain the field that had the treasure in it. In our day, 
These are people who risk their lives to leave North America on overcrowded boats to try and reach the European Union. Or those who walk to the United States through dangerous Central American countries. People will pay human traffickers everything they have to get to their promised land. For them, it's truly a treasure or a pearl of great price. Most of Jesus' other parables talk about the kingdom of heaven and what imagine life would be like on earth if the earth operated on God's rules and not on human rules. Like the prophets before him, Jesus promised a new age of righteousness. First century Jews lived under Roman occupation and oppression, and so Jewish people hoped that the new age would come on earth. It would not be a spiritual rebirth in a spiritual heaven, as so many modern Christians believe. That hope of a better world exists for us today. COVID-19 has opened society's eyes to injustices that we have previously and willfully ignored. Terrible conditions in homes that provide long-term care for our most vulnerable and frail elderly citizens. And likewise for migrant workers who come to Canada to pick our fruits and vegetables. There's lack of affordable housing in our cities. There's low pay for those that we have called essential or frontline workers. So my question is, will we wake up to the fact that all these injustices are the result of how we allocate our money and our other resources? That those of us who live comfortable lives do so because other people do not live in comfort? Will we pay the staff in home care homes and grocery clerks, just to take two examples, wages and benefits that let them live in dignity? Or will the new normal be, go back to being as close as possible to the old normal? Sadly, we saw that when the extra $2 an hour extra pay to grocery clerks was rescinded on June the 30th. Jesus said a lot about what the kingdom of heaven might be like. I think that he was really telling people that he had a dream, <clears throat> the same dream of justice and peace that the Old Testament prophets had. No corruption, fairness for everybody, and this summer, black and indigenous people have pushed their grievances about lack of equality to the fore. They realize that the kingdom of heaven will not arrive stealthily on its own. They must make a noise. They must be in other people's faces. We use the expression hopes and dreams to capture the idea I'm trying to convey. So I think that we could sum up Jesus' parables about the kingdom of heaven as God's dream for us and how we behave towards each other. And that's the message of the hymn, I am the dream and you the dreamer. Because in that song, God dreams about what we might become or what we might achieve. And that's very different from God as ruler of a, of a conventional kingdom, making laws that we have to obey. Because there are two different metaphors for the kingdom of heaven. Either God sets the rules and forces everyone else on earth to be just and righteous. Alternatively, God inspires the dream of justice in us. We saw that second model last week when God inspired Jacob in a dream and changed Jacob's life. It's no coincidence that Martin Luther King used the metaphor of a dream in his famous speech. He dreamed of equal civil and economic rights for African Americans in the United States. And that dream is alive but unfulfilled right now in Canada especially for equality of treatment and opportunity for black and indigenous people. Last month, Michelle and I found the huge Black Lives Matter march in Guelph incredibly inspiring. We watched thousands of young people march for justice after the murder of George Floyd. So perhaps this moment could begin the arrival of the Kingdom of Heaven as a new normal. Or will the old normal return? because that's up to us, individually as well as collectively. But I have to wonder, is dreaming too passive an approach on the ground here in Canada in July of 2020? Because the Kingdom of Heaven can't just be an intellectual exercise, something we don't actually have to do anything about. In that respect, protest marches are important as symbols. They draw attention to injustices. 
question is, are we, who are comfortable, willing to relinquish some of our privileges in society to help those who've been less privileged? Are we willing to pay higher prices for our groceries so that the store clerks get better pay? Will we accept higher taxes to pay for better care for the elderly and to build more affordable housing? Will we vote for candidates in the next election who demand an end to injustice? You may ask, why doesn't God just take the shortcut and impose the divine will upon us? I've addressed this question before. God created us with free will. The will to do good or not to do good. Because imposition of the divine will would make us merely robots. God created us with free will, and God probably grieves when we mess up in this world. But as Pelagius wrote 1500 years ago, the freedom to choose evil as well as good is actually evidence of God's love and care for creation. In the song, I am the dream and you are the dreamer, God is a dreamer. We have to be the action part of God's dream. We can choose or not to be the leaven that helps make God's dream, the kingdom of heaven, come true. We can ask ourselves, is the kingdom really so valuable that it's like a treasure hidden in a field or a pearl of great price that we will pay big money for? So will the new normal bring the kingdom of heaven a little closer or will it be like the old normal? Because that's our choice. Amen. I am the bell, and you the silence, you are the yearning I cannot curtail. I am the blast, and you the blessing, you are the wilds in which I lose my train. Now let us pray. Creator God, we thank you for this day, for your glory shining from sky and lake and stream, in the changing light on the hills of the escarpment, in the flight of bird, the soaring raptors, the colourful blue jays and cardinals, the ever-present chickadees and robins, in the flowers we see in our gardens and meadows, in the fruits and vegetables growing and ripening in our gardens and fields. We thank you for your love experienced in our own lives, for friends new and old, for caring and conversation, for community and solitude, for work and play, for words and silence. We thank you for the gift of creativity, May your spirit help us to use it to bring joy and beauty to the lives of others. We thank you for the gift of time. Help us always to use it wisely, taking time to help others and time to renew our relationship with you. Help us to find the balance between work and play and prayer, knowing that in all we do, we honor you if we do it with love. We remember today and bring to you all who are in need, the sick, the depressed, those who mourn, all who lack food or shelter. Hold them in your loving arms and bring them your comfort, peace and joy. We come to you today with petitions for them and also for ourselves. Your son promised us peace, saying, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We claim this promise for ourselves and for all hurting people everywhere, knowing that you walk with us in good times and in sorrow. 
As always, we bring you our prayers in the name of our Redeemer, your Son Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May the love of Jesus Christ bring us wholeness. The grace of God the Father grant us peace. The breath of Holy Spirit instill passion, and the unity between them give us strength for this and every day. Amen. You are our God, you are our God. We will praise your name, we will praise your name. We will give thanks, we will give thanks for your faithfulness, for your faithfulness. You are our God, we will praise your name. We will give thanks for your faithfulness. You are our God, you are our God, we will praise your name. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made.